Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin, every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. Now the daylight flees. Now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtains torn in two, dead are raised to life, finished the victory cry. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see my name written in the wounds. For through your suffering, I am free. Death is crushed to death. Life is mine to live. Won through your selfless love. This the power of the cross. Son of God, slain for us. Took the wrath. Took the pain. Bore the wrath. What a love what a cost we stand forgiven at the cross. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And as we anticipate participating in this communion service, may our eyes, may our hearts be drawn to you and the power of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to Matthew 26. And I say good morning and greetings in the name of Jesus. It has been a blessing to be gathered with you here this morning. And I trust that this worship can continue as we look at the power of the cross. And we're just going to look at some simple truths here this morning that we have heard already, but it is good for we as humans to be reminded of that again and again. So, in Matthew 26, I would like to jump in at verse 17 to just give a little setting to what we are about to experience here this morning. Now, the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare thee for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it, and brake it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood, and of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 
And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Brothers and sisters, this gives us a setting for our service this morning. Way back when the disciples were walking with Jesus, it's coming down to the end. And this is his last time with all the disciples gathered around. And what does he do? He institutes the beautiful communion service. And he says, do this. Why? In remembrance of me. Because, brothers and sisters, this is the most powerful concept of our walk with God. Our sins are forgiven. Satan is defeated at the cross. So that's the setting as we talk about, as we anticipate communion. And it's supposed to be a reminder for us. So as we go through this service this morning, what is God trying to remind me, you? What is God trying to say to us? My title of the sermon this morning is The Power of the Cross. And my text verse I have taken from 1 Corinthians 1. You can turn there with me. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, Paul is speaking, writing to the church at Corinth, and he's introducing here why he's writing the, writing, the, the letter of Corinthians. And in verse 17, this is what he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So this morning I would like to look at the power of the cross. And Paul is stating here that it goes back to the cross. It's not what we did, it's not what words we say, but it's the power of the cross. That is where we find victory for life. So first of all, to see the power of the cross, come back with me to creation. What did God do? He created the world. We read of it in Genesis 1. Over the course of several days, he spoke the world into existence. Land, sea, trees, animals, you name it. It's there. He spoke it. He got to the end and he said, I need to make mankind somebody in my image. He wanted somebody to commune with, to relate with, somebody in his image. So what did he do? He formed mankind. Beautiful. Adam and Eve in the garden. His ultimate plan was to abide with them, talk with them, commune with them. As we know, that's not the case. Mankind chose to go against that plan. And we know the story, the fall. Satan came in to that garden. And here is a truth of mankind. Man has a soul and a choice. God did not make robots God made mankind with a choice. And here Adam and Eve chose to follow the path of Satan. The fall, sin has now entered mankind. Mankind is doomed for eternity. So we think that, or we, we look back at that story, that instance, we understand how sin came about. Adam and Eve chose that. But that was Adam and Eve. How many of you think you're, you're a pretty good person? Nobody thinks they're good? I'm abnormal. <laughs> if somebody asked me, I would say, yeah, I think I'm a pretty good person. That was a trick question. You, weren't know, you, were, you didn't know how to respond. We all think we're pretty good. We realize our failures. We realize we make mistakes. But we like to think we're a good person. And so many times I look at Adam and Eve and say, it was their choice. Oh, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I was saved. I, I, was, I did some wrong things, but turn to Romans 3, verse 10 with me. I'm going to be looking at a couple scriptures, jumping back and forth here this morning. So those of you students taking notes, have fun. 
Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of their way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. What does this say? None of us are righteous. We are all sinners. And if we cannot accept that fact, if we don't realize we are the lowest of sinners, we will not see the power of the cross. When we see our sinful state, that's when we can stand in awe of what Christ did for us. So my call this morning, first of all, is to see the depravity or sinfulness of man. And should I say ourselves. We are sinners. We have sinned. We are born with a sinful nature. And we are in need of redemption. Isaiah 64, 6 refers to our righteousness as what? Filthy rags. If I think, oh yeah, I'm a pretty good person. The power of the cross will have little effect. We need to view ourselves as sinners. So if I was to ask how many of you are a sinner, I hope we would all raise our hands. But sometimes, I don't know, we tend to put sinners on a scale, right? Oh, this sin's down here. Uh, I'm, I'm a little above that. Is there a scale with sin? Ten commandments. If we look at them, anybody disobey them? A little illustration here. Andrew, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you for an illustration. Would you agree with me that sometimes you think you're a pretty good person? Or you like to view yourself as a good person? Okay, very good. So I have a question for you, Andrew. Um, did you ever covet something somebody else had? Yes, okay. okay. Did you ever steal anything? Like maybe from your mom when you were little or maybe you can't remember that back that far. You think you have, okay, okay. You, did you ever disobey your parents? Oh. Dale, how'd you handle that? <laughs> did you ever, did you ever talk about somebody? Like the word gossip? Probably. Probably. Did you ever say, I hate you to anyone? Don't think so. Well, Andrew, according, this is not my judgment, but according to your judgment, you're a coveting, thieving, gossiping, and disobedient person. And possibly even a murderer, in case you forgot about the one time you said, I hate you. Okay, we laugh. And thank you, Andrew, for letting me use you as an example. But when we put it in that context... As I asked the questions to him, and you thought about your life, how did you answer? If you said yes, you're the same. Do you ever call yourself a coveting, thieving, gossiping, disobedient murderer? But we are, brothers and sisters. We need to view ourselves as sinners in need of a Savior. And if we can have that view of ourself, we can then have a better picture of the power of the cross. If we think we're somebody pretty good, we're not going to have that same view. And God was trying to teach me this this week. As you know, Wednesday night at council, I asked for, for prayer as I studied for this morning. And I was kind of selfish in that prayer request. I don't know about you, but, or how you, have, how you view preachers. But when it is my turn to preach, I want to deliver something that makes an impact on somebody. And I want a message that is good. Mm -hmm. Can you relate with that? I don't know. Wanting to make a good impression. And this week I wanted something that would just impact somebody. But you know what? It's not about my message. It's God's message. And by, my, by me pray, or asking for that request, 
Wednesday night. This message is everybody else. Alex got a group of brothers around me and they prayed for me Wednesday night. My wife pointed me to the poem, the song that I quoted at the beginning. Some other people spoke into my life this week. So this is not mine. It's God's. And if we can have that view, brothers and sisters, that it's not me, we're sinners, we're no good, that's when we can see the power of the cross. The smaller we view ourselves, the more powerful the power of the cross becomes. When I'm standing beside, if I picture myself standing beside Leon, and there's an obstacle in front of us, I look at Leon, I'm not sure which one I would have more trust in. I think I would have more trust in myself. But, you know, we're about the same size, not too much difference. But now, if I was standing beside Claire, and there was an obstacle ahead of us, I would be like, yeah, Claire, let's do this. What happens in that illustration? I'm viewing myself as somebody small. And I look up at Claire, and I say, yeah, Claire, you're taller than me, you're bigger than me, we can do it. That's what I'm talking about. When we view ourselves down here, that's when we can see the power of the cross. So as we think about our sinfulness, my challenge, let's come broken. Let's come broken, we're realizing we are broken sinners in need of a Savior. Our sinfulness. What happens when we see ourselves that way? We're sinners. We can then see the power of the cross. Come back with me a little bit in history again. So we had the fall. Right away in Genesis, God promises to Adam the coming of the Redeemer, the Savior. But he said, not yet. That's coming. So till the Savior comes, there had to be a means for humanity to connect with God. And what was that means? Offering and sacrifice. For sin, there needs to be a sacrifice. There needs to be a payment. The only way to God was a sacrifice. And the book of Leviticus details those offerings and sacrifices that the Israelites had to go through to have their connection with God. It is a mandatory sacrifice for sin. But it was only temporary. Through that, God was drawing people to himself and pointing ahead to the coming of the Messiah, the ultimate sacrifice. Turn to Hebrews 9, verse 11 with me. Another scripture I would like to look at. <clears throat> Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And what we see in he these verses here, Christ came. And right like the atonement the, the animals offered before for a sacrifice for sin, how much more does Jesus' death on the cross have an impact? And it's because of that that we have freedom. And when we think of the weight of sin, Jesus went to the cross and Okay, back to the Israelites. They were to make a sacrifice for often themselves, their families. Okay, a small, local. But Jesus took the weight of the whole world that ever lived and ever will live on his own shoulders. One ultimate sacrifice. That's beyond human comprehension. We can't even fathom that. 
But to get our minds thinking a little bit, Spencer, I'm going to pick on you this morning. Imagine, you know, at school we have those demerits. Yeah. And we have to stay in from recess, right, when we get them. They're not fun. Imagine if, Spencer, I asked you tomorrow, I said, Spencer, for the rest of the year, actually, for the rest of your school years, you have to serve everybody's demerit. That means anytime somebody gets a demerit at school, you have to stay in at break. How would that make you feel? Overwhelmed, right? You wouldn't want to do that, okay? That's just small in comparison. Now, if I was, for you adults, if I was to say, any speeding ticket or fine that anybody ever got in the whole world, you had to pay, <laughs> you'd laugh at me. That's impossible. That, that, that's not even a drop in the bucket of the weight of sin that was upon Jesus, that's just to get our minds thinking. Don't try to compare that with the weight of sin that Jesus felt. But can we start thinking that way and stand in awe at the power of the cross, the weight of sin that was upon Jesus? And as we think of the power of the cross, Satan and sin is defeated in one ultimate sacrifice. After we come broken, after we realize we're sinners, we're covetous, murderers, disobedient, that's when we can say, wow, let's come broken and let's stand in awe. And as we take of the emblems a little later on, let's take that with awe. Our hearts should be filled with wonder, adoration. Why Jesus would have done that for me, for each one. The power of the cross. After we stand in awe, is that where it ends? Does it end with just standing in awe? No. There's a life beyond that. There's a life worth living. What did the third, third stanza of that poem say? Death is crushed. Life is mine to live. There's life beyond. Because of the power of the cross, we're no longer sinners. We can be saved by grace. We are forgiven. And because we are forgiven, we have freedom. And in that freedom, all we need to do is believe and claim that power. It is there, but we have to reach out for it. Titus 2.14 says who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. You see, the power of the cross doesn't just stop with standing in awe. It goes on to a life pursuing godliness and pursuing Jesus. And we can only do that through the power of the cross. Satan and sin are defeated. And because of the power of the cross, this is what becomes so beautiful. And the world today needs examples of this. And because of that power, we need to then serve others and invite others to see the power of the cross. There was a custom of the English kings during the Holy Week, many years ago, back in the 1600s. And again, this illustration comes from my wife with a book she's reading this week. During the Holy Week, the king would gather together poor people, as many as he is old. So if the king was 50, he would gather 50 old people, or poor people, off the street, needed washed up, and he would get their feet and wash their feet. What caused him to do that? They realized that the power of servanthood speaks volumes. And brothers and sisters, after we stand in awe at the power of the cross, after we claim that power, our sins are forgiven, we then turn around and go live a life that is a servant to others. Share it. Share the power. Don't hold it for ourselves. The Sunday school lesson this morning, witness. 
live in the power of the cross. So as we come broken, we can then stand in awe. That should cause us to leave committed servants. So as we think about our sinful nature, the power of the cross, Jesus defeating Satan, I pray that we can live in that power. And in closing, I would like to go back to Isaiah 53. You can turn there with me. I'm going to read through the chapter. This is a chapter that could be read every communion service as it details the sacrifice that Jesus had for us. Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land, out of, of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. I'm not going to make any comments on the ver or those verses there, but I pray as we move into this time of commemorating Christ's death, let's come broken. Let's view ourselves as sinners. So we can see and stand in awe of the power of the cross and leave committed servants living in that power. The power of the cross uh, was a poem song written by Stuart Townsend, Keith Getty. I contemplated singing it this morning, but I'm just going to quote it for you again. If you need to close your eyes, listen to the words. And as we move into this time of commemorating, let's Stand in awe of the power of the cross. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Christ on the road to Calvary. Tried by sinful men. Torn and beaten then. Nailed to a cross of wood. Oh, to see the pain written on your face. Bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. Now the daylight flees. Now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life, finished the victory cry. This the power of the cross. Christ became Sin for us. Took the blame, bore the wrath, we 
stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see my name written in the wounds, for through your suffering I am free. Death is crushed to death. Life is mine to live, won through your selfless love. This, the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning. And as we look at the power of the cross, may we come broken, realizing we're sinners. And may we stand in awe at what you did for us. And may we then live in that power. Be with this time here. May it be special and real to each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Lester.